Afternoon, everybody. It's Wednesday. Scott Sternberg here from SNW headquarters in New Orleans, socially distant. Uh, glad to have you all here with us live on Facebook and also watching this recording later on. And for our clients and friends who've joined us on the Zoom uh, broadcast, uh, you, you may notice my beard is gone. Thank you all for your comments telling me that I should get rid of it. Uh, I will not be starting an alternative rock band anytime soon, but I do uh, have my new partner uh, here today, Ryan Richmond. Uh, I'm really excited that he's here and he is going to talk at our Wednesday web chat about uh, small business reorganization and uh, the new uh, federal laws, which might allow your small business to reorganize in a more efficient way, especially with COVID-19. But even before COVID-19, uh, this was available to you. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, stop my video and let Ryan take it away. Please feel free to chat me your questions um, or uh, Q&A me your questions. And also, we'll be monitoring the Facebook feed if you have questions. So uh, don't hesitate. And uh, Ryan, take it away. You know, thank you, Scott. Uh, and first, let me say uh, I'm very excited to be part of the uh, Sterner, Macri, and White family. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of good things in the future. And I'm very proud and excited to be with a good group of folks uh, down there in New Orleans. Uh, David Lacert and I heading up the Baton Rouge office. So very, very excited to be here. So uh, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019. And this is an act that is sort of flown under the radar. I'm a bankruptcy attorney. I do a lot of bankruptcy work throughout Louisiana and Texas. And I, I was pretty well versed in this act before it became effective in February, but there's a lot of bankruptcy pr practitioners and even just general business and commercial practitioners that uh, aren't aware of this act. And it's sort of flown under the radar, but there's a lot of good things to unpack, unpack under the uh, Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do now is I'm going to share uh, my little PDF presentation of the Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019. Now, keep in mind what, uh, what I've got in here uh, is pretty detailed. There's a lot of stuff in there. I'm not gonna cover everything. Um, please use this uh, presentation as a guide to different issues that you may have. You can give me a call. You can give the good folks down in New Orleans uh, a call as well if you have any Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019 questions. Not gonna cover everything, but I'm gonna do my best to uh, highlight some of the key provisions of this act because there's lots and lots of good stuff to unpack. So let me just scroll down here. The title of this presentation is Increasing a Small Business's Ability to Effectively Organize in Chapter 11. And that's the key is because previously, small businesses had an awful time trying to reorganize in Chapter 11. So this act, which again flew under the radar, is huge for small businesses facing uh, debt liquidity problems or other issues. This allows them to more effectively or reorganize in chapter 11. So wh why small businesses? Well, you can cite various studies, but only about 30% to maybe about half of small businesses survive after the 10 year. But small businesses are really the backbone of the US economy. They represent about 99% of all businesses in the U.S. and roughly 47.5% of the U.S. total workforce. So there's a lot tied up in the small businesses throughout the United States. Remember, companies like uh, Delta Airlines started delivering mail up in Monroe, Louisiana as a small business. One dude with a biplane. Now look at it. It's a major international airline. Amazon started off as a book club online and now look at it it's one of the largest if not the largest company in the world so what we really need to think about is how can we protect these small businesses to allow them to incubate uh, and thrive and grow because sometimes you've got a great business but it may struggle early on and a bankruptcy reorganization while i know bankruptcy has a certain stigma to it can be a good thing for a business well, it, as I alluded to just a moment ago, there was a need for change. The bankruptcy code did contain provisions for dealing with small businesses, but I can, I can be perfectly frank and honest with you. As a practitioner, I did not like handling small business cases because of the expedited timelines that they had 
not that expedited timelines are necessarily bad, it's just the timelines they had weren't conducive to getting a, a chapter 11 done for a small business. So a lot of companies avoided filing chapter 11 that were otherwise small businesses because uh, the absolute priority rule, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, uh, made it difficult, if not impossible, for equity or ownership to keep the company, and it gave creditors pretty much all the leverage in Chapter 11. In addition, you had uh, an exorbitant amount of administrative costs, which made exiting Chapter 11 burdensome. Um, and, you know, small businesses don't always have access to capital markets. Think about it. If you're American Airlines, I'm going to use another airline as an example, you know, you can go hit the pavement on Wall Street and you can find pretty much anyone that's willing to lend. You may not like the terms, but you can, you can find somebody that's going to lend you the money. Small businesses didn't always have that option. Yes, there were some places you could go, but, you know, 20, 25% interest plus, uh, you know, uh, factoring receivables didn't uh, make it very easy for small businesses to exit Chapter 11 because you had to pay your administrative costs, the cost of your accountants, your attorneys, uh, unsecured creditors committees, you had to pay those all off on the effective date of a plan. So it made it real difficult, among other things, for small businesses to, to exit Chapter 11. So what is the Small Business Reorganization Act? It was signed into law on August 23rd, 2019, but it became effective on February 19th, 2020. So this act is less than three months old. It creates a new subchapter, subchapter five, within chapter 11 of the bankruptcy code. And what it's intended to do is to streamline the existing bankruptcy procedures for small businesses and provide them new tools to achieve a successful restructuring. Now, one of the reasons it flew under, under the radar was because it was widely supported by both Democrats and Republicans, as well as the president. Sometimes you only hear about legislation if it's hotly contested and debated uh, in the halls of Congress. The Small Business Reorganization Act uh, was co-sponsored by Democratic senators, Republican senators, uh, Republican members of the House, Democratic members of the House, and was signed into law by President Trump. And barely anybody knew about it because it was so widely supported by both parties, both houses, and the president. So what are some of the key provisions of the Small Business Reorganization Act? Well, for one, only a debtor may file a plan. You get relief from the absolute prior priority rule, which in my opinion is the single biggest um, key provision of the Small Business Reorganization Act. Uh, as, as, well, as long as you're pro providing projected disposable income over a three to five year period, you can satisfy uh, the fair and equitable standard that was a bar to so many Chapter 11s in the small business arena. There's no official committee, committee of unsecured creditors, which is huge, again, reducing the administrative costs. And a trustee is appointed in every single small business Chapter 11 case now, but the trustee doesn't run the business. And I'll get into some of the details about what a trustee is because I'm actually one of the uh, trustees here in the state of Louisiana for small business cases. So. Uh, it's kind of personal to me, and I, I've got some inside information on what it means to be a small business trustee. So what are the general objectives of the Small Business Reorganization Act? Quicker, less expensive, more effective. Boom, there you go. Three points. Those are the major objectives of the Small Business Reorganization Act, and I think the act does a pretty darn good job of uh, satisfying all three of those objectives. Let's talk about quicker. The Small Business Reorganization Act makes small business reorganizations cheaper. How does it do that? Well, it reduces it, uh, reducing the disclosure requirements. In a regular chapter 11, you're supposed to put together what's called a disclosure statement. Now, it's not as detailed as a prospectus if you wanted to engage in an IPO, but the disclosure statement did have to provide a background of the debtor regarding its financial information, how it got into chapter 11, and a lot of other details. A typical uh, disclosure statement in a chapter 11 case, even with, uh, I'll say, Times New Roman 11 point font and uh, 0.9 inch margins all around could still run you, not including any exhibits, roughly 40 to 50 pages. 
takes a lot of attorney time and a lot of paralegal time to put it together. Okay, the next thing that makes it less expensive is it eliminates the quarterly fees due to the US trustee. Those fees in a regular Chapter 11 are based upon the disbursements that the debtor makes each quarter. And it's kind of like, I don't wanna call it a tax, but it's, it's a charge. Uh, it's a charge on the privilege of being in Chapter 11 and it's paid to the US trustee fund. That's eliminated for small businesses. Um, and it place, places expedited timelines on the debtor. Now, in the old, which technically it's still there, the, but I'll call it the old or the traditional small business route through chapter 11, it had expedited timelines, but it had goofy timelines like the debtor has to confirm the plan within 45 days of the plan being filed, but you still have to file a disclosure statement and the bankruptcy rules require 28 days notice of the disclosure statement hearing. Well, 28, 45 minus 28 gives you 17 and you have to have another 28 days to uh, have a hearing on your plan. So 56 and 45 don't mix. So you had some really goofy timelines that made it really difficult for uh, a bankruptcy case to get going. Well, the Small Business Reorganization Act eliminates a lot of those old deadlines and places I think more efficient expedited timelines on the debtor. More effective, okay, this, this is a big one. By eliminating the uh, absolute priority rule, it makes it more effective for small business debtors. And the way it does that, and we'll get into some more details on the absolute priority rule, but it doesn't force a debtor to dedicate all of its income in future years to the payment of debt so that owners can keep the company. Sometimes small businesses just can't afford to pay everyone. As Judge Lou Kornreich um, up in the District of Maine said, sometimes there's not enough blueberries in the pie. And so you have to figure out who's getting what blueberries. And under the absolute priority rule, if you didn't have enough, you couldn't stay. So it also makes, the Small Business Reorganization Act also makes uh, bankruptcy for small businesses more effective because it utilizes a mediator-like subchapter five trustee to facilitate consensual plans reorganization. In, in the good old days, you would have creditors committees or large uh, secured creditors trying to negotiate with the debtor. And that didn't always make things very efficient because you've had four or five parties that are dealing directly with the debtor. And there's nobody in the middle kind of going, hey, time out guys, what are our interests? Let's try and identify what we're really after, what's really the core of this dispute because sometimes uh, debtors and creditors don't get along. You might be PO'd at your, your, your bank because they're not giving you the relief you wanted and the bank might be PO'd at you because it, you, you don't have the cash to pay them the full amount of the forbearance agreement that uh, you agreed to six months earlier. So uh, that's just a few of the ways that it makes uh, subchapter five more effective for small businesses. I think I might have accidentally skipped over less expensive, so let's go to that real quick. Again, it, uh, let's see here, did I get it all? E quicker, let's go back to quicker. I think I missed quicker, that's the one I missed. The Small Business Reorganization Act also makes it quicker. It eliminates the unsecured creditors committee, so you don't have to have that delay in waiting for a committee to be appointed. Again, you've got a mediator like subchapter trustee, subchapter five trustee that can step in and uh, help facilitate consensual plans of reorganization. And you also eliminate that two-step confirmation process with the disclosure statement and then the plan. Um, you could sometimes do it by combining or getting conditional approval of the disclosure statement and then having a, a combined hearing. But again, you're talking about filing a separate motion, which is additional costs uh, to get conditional approval of the disclosure statement. So this just uh, sidesteps all those um, uh, procedures and just combines everything into one. So, once you file your plan, it's probably, excuse me, going to be up for hearing in about 30 days. So who is eligible for a small business reorganization case? Uh, any person uh, with the exclusion of railroads, they're carved out, um, are eligible for uh, subchapter five relief under the Small Business Reorganization Act. They have to have, though, a an aggregate amount of non-contingent liquidated secured and unsecured debt of not more than $2.7 million. The CARES Act modified that, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but the statute as it is written 
you got to have less than about $2.75 million in aggregate debt. Um, and this one's important for individuals, not less than 55% of the debt or 50% of the debt may arise from uh, non-business activities. So if you are the guarantor of a business and you've got a ton of uh, debt on your personal balance sheet because you personally guaranteed the business or you leveraged your own assets to put the proceeds of that leverage into the business, this is a key provision. Uh, single asset real estate debtors are not eligible, although there's some case law out there, I believe from either Arizona or California, which, which talks about uh, single asset real estate debtors uh, and their eligibility because Congress changed some of the language. I'm not going to get into single asset real estate debtors. That's a discussion for another day, but basically it's an entity that derives all of its income from uh, the management or ownership of land. Think of like an apartment building or if you just own some unencumbered land for investment purposes, um, that would be a, a single asset real estate. Um, another important provision is that the debtor must affirmatively elect for treatment under new subchapter five. As I mentioned, under the old small business provisions, um, if you had less than the aggregate debt, you had to go, you had to take the small business route. The, small, the old small business route didn't go away it's still there. So you can affirmatively elect to choose subchapter five relief, which is what the Small Business Reorganization Act is all about, or you can go the old route. Personally, I think it's malpractice if you go the old route because it was just cumbersome, burdensome, uh, particularly with the relief from the absolute priority rule. I think uh, it's borderline malpractice unless there's a really good reason and I can't think of one to go the old route, which is still in place. Um, Subchapter five relief under the Small Business Reorganization Act makes all the sense in the world. As I mentioned, the CARES Act, uh, the, in response to the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, Congress temporarily increased the debt limit. So it's gone from 2.7 and change to 7.5 million for cases commenced before December 31st, 2020. So if you have a case uh, that you have some issues, you got to file before to on or before December 31st if you have more than 2.75, but less than $7.5 million in debt. Otherwise, January 1st, 2021, uh, the debt limit automatically decreases. There's already some calls from some law professors and other academics to make the debt limit permanent at $10 million. I think that makes a lot of sense um, because there's no uniform definition of what a small business is in the United States. If you look at the SBA regulations, Louisiana, Texas state regulations, it's all over the place. So I, I think that uh, $10 million debt cap uh, being made permanent going forward in the future makes a lot of sense. But getting back to the CARES Act, it made relief for a lot more businesses available under the Small Business Reorganization Act. So again, sometimes Congress swings and misses horribly, but at least as it uh, pertains to small businesses, it's batting two for two. Uh, with respect to the CARES Act, Bankruptcy Relief, and the Small Business Reorganization Act of, of 2019. Uh, again, the old Chapter 11 remains. Uh, didn't repeal the old Chapter 11 for small businesses. You can see some of the expedited timelines that are in place here. Again, um, that 45-day uh, deadline to confirm a plan, uh, if you didn't do it, it was just deadly to your case. So, I do not recommend opting into subchapter five, even though the old rules are still there. It just makes all the sense in the world to go subchapter five and affirmatively elect relief. Okay, the absolute priority rule. This is, this is probably the biggest one, uh, the single business, biggest key provision of the Small Business Reorganization Act. Under the absolute priority rule, I won't get into the mechanics of how you confirmed a plan under the old chapter 11, but basically if you had a class of creditors that dissented, in other words, they voted not to accept the plan, you could still confirm the plan if you're the debtor, but the plan had to be fair and equitable. What does it mean to be fair and equitable? Basically, the absolute priority said, rule says with some very, very, very extremely narrow exceptions, the absolute priority rule said, hey, you, it, senior classes of creditors have to get paid in preference to junior classes of creditors. So if you're a secured creditor, 
you had to get paid from your, the value of your collateral. If you were a priority creditor, like a tax claimant or uh, someone that's owed a domestic support obligation like alimony or child support, you get paid in preference to general unsecured creditors. And gen general unsecured creditors, guess what? They get paid in preference to equity. So it gave unsecured creditors a huge amount of leverage to say, look, um, we're not gonna support this plan unless we get paid in full or you could come up with some other way to make us happy. So equity, which has probably put a lot of time and effort into starting up the business and running it and operating it themselves, wouldn't be able to keep the company because they could never satisfy the fair and equitable rule and then satisfy the absolute priority rule within that. So it gave uh, creditors, particularly unsecured creditors, a huge amount of leverage. And it, it was frankly, um, it spelled doom for so many small business reorganizations in the United States. But now the absolute priority rule is eliminated or at least significantly modified. And this is probably the single most significant feature of the Small Business Reorganization Act. It redefines fair and equitable under subchapter five. So what does fair and equitable mean? There's a couple of different ways you can satisfy fair and equitable, but the big one is projected disposable income. Many authors and academics, law professors and judges and practitioners have written that the Small Business Reorganization Act in subchapter five was designed to look a lot like chapter 12, reorganization for family farmers and fishermen, as well as chapter 13, which is uh, debt reorganization for individuals with regular income. And the term projected disposable income pops up in both th those chapters. So as long as the debtor pays its projected disposable income or an amount not less than its projected disposable income, over the life of a small business plan, it will satisfy the, the fair and equitable standard under the Small Business Reorganization Act. And that's huge because again, sometimes if you're a small business, cash flow is king. If you look at your cash flow statement and you've only got X left over, and now you've got to figure out how to, to pay three times X under a, uh, an old sub, uh, or under an old small business reorganization plan, it ain't gonna work. But now basically what you do is you take that delta between your gross revenues and the income that's left over after payment of uh, it, all your expenses that are necessary for operating the business. That, that's what you have to put on the plan. And that was the standard under uh, chapter 12 and chapter 13 for individuals. Now, as a side note, it's not surprising that the projected disposable income standard looks like a chapter 12 case in many ways because Senator Grassley, I believe, was uh, one of the senior members of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the time. And uh, he's from Iowa, obviously. So in many ways, a lot of the ch chapter 12 provisions for family farmers and fishermen were grafted on to new subchapter five. So if you're an attorney out there and you don't know what projected disposable income means in a business case, there's a lot of cases out there uh, under chapter 12, which dictate how a farm can calculate projected disposable income. So there's some good analogy, but this is probably the single biggest feature of the Small Business Reorganization Act is the elimination or at least significant modification of the absolute priority rule such that all the debtor has to do is pay its projected disposable income over a life of plan and it can confirm a plan over a dissenting class of creditors. Again, projected disposable income simply means income not necessary, reasonably necessary for the payment of expenditures necessary for the con continuation, preservation, or operation of the business of the debtor. The Supreme Court has uh, already opined as to what projected means. It's a forward-looking standard. Um, the, the, a bankruptcy court can account for changes in the debtor's uh, future income or expenses that are known or virtually certain to uh, occur at the time of confirmation. So if you're a small business and you need to get some trucks in a year or two, or you're a warehouse and you need to put on a new roof because the old roof is, is starting to leak, so you know that that capital expenditure, expenditure is coming up within a reasonable amount of time uh, and is virtually certain, that, uh, that reduces your projected disposable income because that's an expense 
that uh, is necessary for the continuation of the business. I think projected disposable income is probably going to be the battleground for most of the confirmation uh, fights in these small business cases. But again, if you got the subchapter tr five trustee trying to negotiate on behalf of creditors and the debtor to mediate their interests, I think a lot of this, a lot of the fighting is probably going to go away. Um, again, this is huge and significant because it allows equity, ownership, members, shareholders to keep their business, even if they don't pay dissenting creditors 100% of their claims. The old standard was an almost impossible for small businesses to meet because of the lack of any uh, capital markets or any liquidity that they might have in exiting Chapter 11. Um, I'll mention this briefly, and this is big for individuals that may have to file subchapter five, but you can modify a mortgage. So for instance, say that um, you're a business owner and you have put a mortgage, uh, an equity mortgage or whatever kind of mortgage on your home because uh, you needed operating funds for the business. And so your house is mortgaged, but the proceeds of that mortgage loan went into the company. Well, the Small Business Reorganization Act allows you to modify that mortgage uh, so long as the, the loan was not used to acquire the residence and the proceeds were used primarily in connection with the business of the debtor. So um, that's a huge modification because sometimes members in the individual Chapter 11 cases had a hard time of meeting the absolute prior, priority rule. And there was a lot of case law out there that basically said, you didn't get to keep anything in an individual Chapter 11 case unless you satisfied the absolute priority rule. And with certain debt limits uh, on, on Chapter 13s, if you were a high earner and needed to file bankruptcy, let's say a doctor, lawyer, accountant, whoever, where you had a large guarantee, um, Chapter 11 was very difficult for individuals. So um, this is another home run by Congress, the mortgage modification provision. Subchapter 5 trustees, if this is, if, if the absolute priority rule is number one, uh, subchapter five trustees are number two. I'm kind of partial to the subchapter five trustees because I'm one of them here in the state of Louisiana. There are, uh, there's several in the Western District, two of us here in the Middle District and two down in the Eastern District. Um, and so what we do is we, we don't take over the business, although there are provisions for the trustees to temporarily take over the business, but the Small Business Reorganization Act created a position that's like a mediator. The subchapter five trustee, again, doesn't run the business, but one of his or her duties is to help the parties reach a consensual plan of reorganization. So it's a mediative like effect and it helps the parties identify their mutual interests. I have filed two subchapter five cases as debtors counsel here in the middle district of Louisiana. And the two trustees I have have been fantastic because they've done a great job of going between the parties, just like a mediator would in breakout sessions saying, you know, look, this is what I'm hearing from the other side. What do you think? How can you afford that? What can you do? And, and just the back and forth and having that neutral third party is huge. So um, this is the number two provision as far as I'm concerned is the subchapter five trustees. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go over the, the next few provisions it, because they're, they're not as important, but they're also significant. Um, we talked about the expedited timelines in the chapter or subchapter five small business cases. Um, they are significantly reduced compared to the old small business cases. Basically the way it works is you've got to file a status or a status report within 46 days. The court conducts a status conference within 60 days and you have to file your plan within 90 days. Not only does that make the subchapter five case, the small business case, much more uh, quicker, but it also reduces the opportunity to go back and fight and incur expenses. So the status conference is a big one. We, I just had two of them in my cases the other day and the bankruptcy judge, you know, asked a lot of good questions. It's an opportunity for the parties to kind of advise the court where they're at. And so the, the status conference is a powerful tool, especially when combined with the mediation duties of the subchapter five trustee. Again, there's a combined plan and disclosure statement. Technically the act talks about one plan or the, the, the lack of a necessity to file a separate disclosure statement, but a good practice tip is 
to combine a lot of the disclosure statement like information, particularly financial statements, uh, financial analysis. It doesn't have to be exhaustive like um, a prospectus, but having a little bit more information in there is always a good thing because it short circuits any arguments that there's not enough information. But uh, previously, the debtor was required to file two separate documents. It took at least 60 days for those documents to be heard and approved. Well, now there's only one, so it only takes about 30 days. So that's a huge benefit of the act. Um, payment of administrative claims. This is another one. This, this might be number three as far as I'm concerned. But previously, for a, for a debtor to confirm a plan, it had to be able to demonstrate that it could pay administrative costs like attorney's fees on the effective date of a plan. That also included U.S. trustee fees. Well, now those fees could be spread out over the life of a plan similar to a Chapter 13 case. So let's say that there's $24,000 in uh, attorney's fees on the uh, effective date of a plan. Well, those can be, you can divide that by 24 if you're the debtor and pay $1,000 per month under the plan. Previously, $24,000 had to be paid on day one. And when you're a small business debtor, sometimes you have liquidity problems and you don't have access to capital markets. Well, that's, uh, that's, this is big that you can spread those out over time. Again, the expedited guidelines or deadlines, excuse me, uh, just shorten everything. Previously, cases could take 300 days. Now you're talking about 90 to 120. So again, the cost savings, the time savings um, are, are huge. Um, and in conclusion, I, I think the, the Small Business Reorganization Act is a major step forward uh, towards a more effective and less expensive reorganization process. Um, Congress, again, I think should increase the debt cap to 10 million and make it permanent. And there are benefits to both uh, creditors and debtors alike, particularly the subchapter five trustee being that mediator that can be the go-between. Because uh, sometimes you just want to vent to somebody and having that cathartic um, venting to somebody that's not your adversary or shouldn't or you perceive as your adversary is huge. Um, you know, the, the trustees in my cases have been fantastic and I think they've really helped in moving along the cases. So um, I, I think this uh, Small Business Reorganization Act is a home run on so many different levels. And, uh, you know, if, if you're a company that's struggling with your cash flow right now in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I think there are a lot of advantages to the Small Business Reorganization Act. And it's very fortuitous that Congress passed this back in 2019. It becomes effective in mid-February and then the pandemic hits in March. So, you know, it's, it's not always uh, the case that Congress does something good or does it uh, on time. And I think in both cases, it's checked all the boxes with this act. So uh, if anybody has any questions, um, I'll, post, uh, I'll post these materials um, on our website. You can feel free to give me a call or email me at ryan at snwlaw or snw.law. I got to get used to saying that. Uh, or you can call me 225-572-2819. But uh, my number's up on the website and my email's on the website. So if you have any questions, whether you're a potential debtor or a creditor needing to protect assets, I'd be happy to help. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we're really excited to have you with us here uh, at SNW, even if it is uh, during a very strange time in, in uh, the practice of law. Um, we are going to go ahead and wrap up the Wednesday web chat for today. Uh, we're going to post this on our website shortly. Uh, we've had quite a few viewers on Facebook, a lot to digest. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to Ryan at uh, snw.law is our website. He's got a profile page up there uh, under uh, Meet the Team, or you can email him at ryan at snw.law. And uh, glad to have you, Ryan. Welcome to the team. Everybody stay safe. Wash your hands. Thanks. Thank you very much, Scott. I'm glad to be here. See you next week, everybody.